So if you think about the, uh, I want to set some context, some high-level context here, and then I'll dig into some real specifics. If you think about the S&P 500, so that's a major the top 500 companies uh, index fund, basically. How long do you think companies stay on that index? To the top 500 companies. Okay, two years. Other guesses? Five, six. All right. So let's look at it over time. So long ago back in the 50s, they would stay on for over 60 years once they got to that place. Extreme dominance when she got to be a big, um, meaningful company. But look at how that's shaping over time. So here's the, here's the trend. Start out as about 61 years on average. It's trending down now to about 18 years, and the trend keeps going down. So let's put this in terms of your animals, animals and how long they live, to make this real. So basically, your average big company Best 500 companies in the, in the world or on this index fund are going to stay on that fund about as long as your dog is going to be alive. Now, it used to be that they would stay on there about as long as a whale would live. Huge, huge rate of change. Now, the flip side of this is Google went from founding to the S&P 500 in eight years. Tremendous change, tremendous opportunity. And so I want to ask here is, how do we prepare our students to enter this world of extreme, constant change where these companies come and go? Everything around them is constantly changing in a very different way than it did 50, 60, 80 years ago. So how did we get here? I want to lay a little bit of context for how we got here because I think that will help inform how we move forward um, in these high uncertainty, very dynamic environments. This is Fred Taylor. He wrote one of the kind of canons of management science about 100 years ago called The Principles of Scientific Management. So he looked at industries and looked at how to manage workers and realized that there were some fundamental things that, that he innovated on and could do that had dramatic increase in productivity. And what he figured out was is that if managers figured out how to do the work and they figured it out to exact detail, and then timed the workers while they were doing the work and had the philosophy that the workers cannot improve. Management is the only entity in the organization that can figure out how best to do the work. That's what he invented. Does that sound familiar still? <laughs> that was 100 years ago. And I think it's important to think about the context of his work. He was thinking about this quote here. So this is from um, Principles of Scientific Management. He was really focused on prosperity of these companies 
and it came down to individual efficiency. It's really important, though, to remember what he was talking about. He was talking about Pennsylvania Dutchmen moving 90-pound blocks of pig iron. He was talking about metal lathers, and he was talking about women and school children inspecting ball bearings. So that was the context in which that type of management science worked pretty well. Do we do any of this stuff much today? But yet most of our systems are still built around this mindset and an education to some degree is still built around preparing students to enter this type of work. So that was all around ma maximizing individual efficiency. 50 years later, Taichi Ono releases another pretty significant canon of management science um, about the Toyota production system. So this is the, this brand new system that was outpacing the world and being able to produce cars. And he was saying that if we take a look at the moment somebody gives us an order and we deliver that, and we take all the waste out in between that, nirvana. That's what this management system was all about. And the way he did that is he said, we're going to focus on the individuals now, the people closest to the problems in the work. They're the ones most capable of figuring this all out. And we're going to encourage them to run experiments, continue to think about how to do that work. And so you get assembly lines like this. But again, a lot of the people, especially knowledge work, we're not working on an assembly line. We're doing very creative things. So this was a huge step forward toward that, but I think there's still more work that we can do that goes beyond this concept of maximizing the flow of value. Because the biggest challenge when everything is changing around you is it's very hard to figure out what's valuable, what the market will want, what industry will want, what entrepreneurs are willing to, to build and, and others to fund. And so we've got some things that we can do here. So I want to talk about how we can prepare our students for entering this type of world, which I believe is much more what we're faced now day to day. How many of you, have, I, when I ask this question in some audiences, I, I, I'm pretty sure here I'm going to get a 100% answer on this one. So how many of you have done a science fair project or helped someone do a science fair project? Awesome. Then you all know how to do this. We have experience doing this. We just need to tune it and refine it a little bit. So the key thing here, and we're dealing in, in constantly changing environments, is, is that we've got a tremendous amount of uncertainty. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's going to get us. We have all these risks. We have unknowns. We have uncertainty. And we need some mechanism to turn that into knowledge or evidence about what's going to work, either in a process or in a product or an offer into the marketplace. The cool thing is, is we have the scientific method to do that. With a couple little tweaks, it can be very effective. So the first piece in the scientific method, we call this research. I actually like to borrow from design thinking and call this frame. And the key idea here is, is that we're framing the problem, and then we're also framing the experiment to make sure we run an effective experiment. So what does this mean? And where's the power of this? So most people think it, it's all in figuring out the solution. But Einstein, I really like this quote. He had the insight that, no, it's actually about figuring out the problem and correctly framing the problem. That's the power. The challenge is, so I, I teach in engineering school at CU. Um, most of the students, when they go through that undergraduate career, they've done this following game 5,000 times, which is, here is a problem, a well-written, well-described, closed system problem. The game is, there's one right solution. If you find that right solution, and be sure and articulately write out all your work, you get a good grade. The problem is the world that we're going into, the magic is in figuring out the problem, not figuring out the solution. So how do we do that? We start by interviewing people. We build empathy for the people that we're trying to solve these problems for. And that starts by face-to-face -face interaction. Understand them, get to know them. We've got this beautiful brain that's got mirror neurons in it. So if you talk to somebody and they're in that FM, fMRI, functional MRI machine, their brain lights up this way. And your brain, if you happen to be listening to that same um, story, is going to light up in a very similar way. And the key idea here is, is that will give you insights, which then informs your intuition to help you frame the problem. Because intuition still plays a big part in solving these big problems. An example of this, um, some Stanford students uh, were given a design challenge to uh, in a third world environment of Nepal, um, improve the, the, um, basically the survival rates of children. And they thought, OK, it's probably that the incubators are too expensive and they don't work and they can't get parts out in the field. 
So they were thinking, we just need to build a cheaper incubator. They were encouraged to go out there. They flew out into the field, went to a hospital, and saw a row of about 15 perfectly functional incubators. And they asked the doctors, what's up? Are they all broken? Why aren't there any kids in there? You don't have any parts? And they're like, oh, no, they work perfectly fine. Kids never make it here. They all die out in the field two hours from here. So the kids all went, the students went out into the field, did a bunch of empathy work, and they realized that it, the design problem, the challenge was not finding or building a cheaper incubator or a, an incubator that would um, work cheaply in a hospital. It was to actually keep kids warm in the two-hour journey it takes to get to the hospital. So they built this about $20. Um, we would basically call that a sleeping bag. Um, very powerful. Saved, I think, now about 300,000 lives in the field. And it's important, too, to think about culture when we do these sorts of things. Like, if you look at that little um, hole in the middle there, you look at that and you think, what on earth is that about? Well, in that culture, if the parents, and especially the moms, couldn't see the heart area of the child, they wouldn't use this. So they built a bunch of these that didn't have that. Nobody used them. It was just like the incubators in the hospital just sitting there. So that's the power of empathy and framing correctly. The next part here is, is designing. Um, so I come from an agile and lean background where we have a lot of techniques for building rapidly. The key idea here, you can think of Scrum, you can do some research on Scrum or uh, Kanban. The idea here is very quack, quick, rapid iterations. Frame your experiment, build quickly, get feedback, and learn from it. So you can Google Scrum or Kanban and get some really um, kind of simple techniques on how to encourage that type of work in your classroom. The next piece is measure. Um, most people that run experiments or try to gain knowledge, the thing that I find when they get into it is they realize they get done and they go, oh, we don't have any data. We didn't actually collect any meaningful data. So collecting that data is the first thing. And so as you're building your experiment, doing your work, make sure that you have the ability to collect. Then analyze because you want to turn that data into something that's more than just data. It's actually information. And then a key piece is organizing in a way that you can teach and share it with others. You all know how to do this in the classroom, which is, is really neat. When I do this in industry, everybody kind of looks at me like, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Um, so that's where educators, I think, have a real powerful position here because you're used to doing this with students. The last piece is learning. And this is a critical step in this and an important precondition to this. So our brains have this really cool thing called hindsight bias in it. It's a defense mechanism that helps us get through life, but when it comes to learning, it really gets in our way. So what our brain does is when, every th when something happens, we reflect back on that and we go, yeah, that's about exactly what I was expecting. The challenge is that learning lives in between what you expect will happen and what actually happens. And if you write, don't write down what you expect will happen, that hindsight bias robs that middle part there, that step of learning. So I always encourage people when they do experiments to frame the experiment. Um, and write it down. Write down the background. What's the context? Why are you want to learn about this? What's your hypothesis? What's the you know, classic kind of um, scientific method? And for those of you who are experimenting within the education system, there's another important thing I encourage you to think about. Um, so that's the, the corporate immune system or the um, sort of bureaucratic immune system that comes out when anything is sort of unlike everything else and says you can't do that. A very important thing to think about here is the safety of running these experiments. How is this safe to run? Just like in your classrooms, you wouldn't have a big block of water or a big tank of water and let somebody dump a large block of sodium into it. That's just not safe to run. Same thing happens when you do this type of experimentation on the system, on the classroom, inside of corporations. And then when you learn from it, be sure and document that so you can compare it and have this knowledge over time. A key thing here is most people think about, well, what's the sort of validated learning that I got. Really important to also think about the ancillary insights. Because most times the joke is when a scientist goes, huh, that's when the key breakthrough is right next door. And so be sure and be aware of those moments and, and celebrate them. And a key thing to consider too is when we're doing this experimentation, the goal here is to maximize the rate of learning. And an important realization in that is you maximize learning when 50% of the time you get an unexpected result. And in my mind, the only failed experiment is, a, is an experiment that you don't learn from. An expected result, you learn from. An unexpected result, you learn from. What I often see when I do this in industry is people run experiments and 100% of the time they get the expected result. And to me, that means you don't have enough safety in the environment. It's, you're not in an environment where it's safe 
for you to have that moment where you go, wow, I didn't expect that. So you run experiments proving what you already know, which is a very expensive way to waste a bunch of time and effort because you already know what you know. And if you get results all the time that you don't expect, that means you haven't done enough empathy work. Go out into the field. Get face to face with the people uh, in the environments where you're trying to solve their problems. So I think these are, are at a philosophical level, is a very tactical level, ways that we can help our students that we teach and people in industry prepare themselves for a very rapid, very changing, an environment where those who can solve the wicked problems um, will be at a, a distinct advantage uh, in life and society. Uh, tomorrow I'll be doing a workshop where I um, will dive much more into the actual techniques here of empathy work and experimentation framing. Um, but it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. or something of open source tools or softwares that you have to help with data collection uh, within, I know Khan Academy has something that they're working on like that um, to sort of increase the, the potential of data collection within the classroom. So you're doing experimentation? Yeah, experimentation or, or just uh, student progress in general. Yeah, so questions around um, open source things to collect data. There's a ton of things out there, and we use a bunch of different things in the classroom and in the industry. Um, oddly enough, Excel, Google Spreadsheets, is one of the most effective tools that we use. Um, because you want the bar super low. Uh, and I actually am a firm believer in a lot of paperwork. So um, we, when, when we have our students do empathy interviews, uh, we have them recorded on sheets of paper. Uh, because I don't want them behind a computer. I want them literally kinesthetically interacting with a pen, very focused on the person that they're talking to. We have them do it in pairs too, so we often have somebody that's responsible for the data and somebody who's solely responsible for the human connection. That's another key kind of component. There's one more question. But Zach will be here tomorrow, and it would be wonderful for you. I think the, the practice that we're learning of trying something and learning from it in our classrooms, I mean, as I said before, we all talk about innovation, but it's actually you all. They get to try things and experiment and see if it works. This, 
this change is going to happen in a million tiny experiments, not with one big book of curriculum that gets served down on high. You all know that from your rooms. So Zach is really here to train us in that. Oh, it's tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Yes. Tomorrow afternoon. I, I think it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. I'm getting tired. I'm not thinking about it. But yes, tomorrow afternoon. So please come and hear. Thank you so much. Thank you all.